On February 4th of 2015, my husband of 24 years committed suicide. His suicide was a complete shock to me and everybody who knew him. He was highly intelligent. He had a great job. His health was great. He seemed to have everything. He was afraid. Unfortunately, he was overtaken by his fears. And none of the, us, even those of us who were closest to him, could see that his mind was crumbling. None of us could see that fear was overtaking his life. I don't remember much of what happened that night. I don't remember all the traumatic events. But I do remember calling 911. I remember the paramedics streaming into my apartment. I remember performing CPR. And then I remember, as the paramedics came in, calling three of my closest friends, one of whom was in law enforcement. And as people continued to stream into my apartment, the scene became very chaotic. But at the same time, time stood still. Later that night, one of my friends took me to her apartment and put me into her bed. I know I didn't sleep much that night. I was shaking. The next morning when we got out of bed, friends continued to come over to her apartment and my rabbi came over. There were decisions to be made, people to call, and a funeral to plan. You can imagine I was in complete and total shock. I really couldn't think. In the days and weeks that followed, I felt a lot of confusion. I don't remember, as I said, much of it. But I do remember really struggling with some of the most basic things in life. I remember that a friend emailed me an article about dealing with grief. And I remember trying to read the email and trying to read the article, and I couldn't focus on the words on the page. I didn't know how to make sense of what had just happened. I was afraid. Even the simplest things like getting out of bed scared me. Two days after my husband's death, my uncle, who's my number one mentor and coach in life, and I'll come back to that concept later, came over to my apartment and said, I want 30 minutes alone with you. And I kind of looked at him and said, can you give me a break? And so we sat alone in my bedroom, just the two of us. And he looked at me and he said, I want you back at work on Monday. I want you to go back to your office and I want you to begin working again. And I looked at him and I kind of thought, and as I was about to say something to him, like, are you kidding? He continued and he said, you're an entrepreneur. You have started from scratch before. 15 years ago, you had an idea. You've put everything you had into this idea. You've been courageous. You've been fearless. You've thought big. You've let your mind wander. And you've built something beautiful. And so from that moment, I wasn't really ready, but I knew that it was time to begin again. Two weeks after David's death, I was faced with a choice. And I was faced with the choice of going on a business trip that was planned well in advance of his death or canceling the trip. And the trip was going to be a big trip for me. Uh, I was hoping that I was going to go and visit with a prospective client and close on what would be my biggest deal ever. But I also knew that I was scared and that I was feeling very vulnerable. I knew that I still wasn't thinking clearly. How was I going to go stand in front of a very successful CEO and his leadership team and inspire confidence and strength, all the while knowing that I really felt very vulnerable? And I thought about my uncle's words, and I thought about how much it meant to me to be an entrepreneur, and I thought about the last 15 years of my life and how much time I had spent building my business and the business that I was so proud of. 
And so I went on the trip. And I stood there in that meeting, and I gave my presentation. And I tried to inspire confidence in this company, in this team of leaders who were looking at me and ready to hand to me a very important piece of their business, something critical to the future of their business. And what I knew and what I learned in that moment was vulnerability didn't make me weak. Showing my vulnerability was not a weakness. That I could be a strong and successful business person and I could be vulnerable at the same time. And that what they saw in front of them wasn't weakness. What they saw was me. And it, what ended up coming out of that meeting was a great trust and understanding between us because I was honest with them. I didn't have a choice of whether or not to show my vulnerability. I was vulnerable. That day, they awarded me the piece of business. I really didn't expect to go into that meeting and get the business. What I really wanted that day was just to make it out of there without crumbling. And as I came out of that meeting, something struck me. I, my mind started to re-engage. And this concept, a concept from my past came back to me. And it was this idea of big thinking, thinking about what I could be. And I spent the next week or so of my trip thinking about big thinking. And that sounds funny to say thinking about big thinking, but I was thinking about th big thinking. And I was thinking about my own comeback. And I began to think about this gift that I had been given, this gift of being able to build a brand new life. And it struck me in that moment that I felt like I did in high school. I felt like I had all of these choices in front of me, and sometimes they were overwhelming, and I didn't know what to do with all of these choices. And I realized that in those moments, I had to come up with some themes for myself, some tools, some tools in my tool belt to pull out in these moments of, of vulnerability and fear. Uh, and that surrounding myself with really smart people, with thoughtful people, with people that cared about me, would be one of the keys to my beginning again and to my own successful comeback as an entrepreneur. So I would encourage you, as I was feeling like a high schooler and as you are today, to surround yourself with people who care about you, to surround yourself with really smart people, people who can add to your life, people who can add value. I thought a lot about listening. I listened to a lot of people. I asked a lot of questions. And when I was done asking questions, I asked more questions. And I started listening to people tell their stories of triumphs and pain in their lives. And what I learned was that those people who had triumphed, those people who had come back, they weren't defined by the hard things that had happened to them in life. Those things made them stronger. But successful people aren't defined by the hardships in their past. I learned to say yes. Here I was, this strong woman, and I thought being independent and showing myself to the world as a strong woman was what mattered. And in those moments and in the months after his death, I was physically and mentally weak. I had to say yes. I had to let people help me, even with the simplest things. I remember one day, I let two of my friends come over to clean out my refrigerator and my freezer. And here it was this simple task, and I wasn't even capable of that simple task. But what I realized was that as people, we want to help other people. And I realized in that moment that helping other people would help me. And I continued this theme of thinking big. And this became, for me, a dominant theme. And along with that came this notion of overwhelming effort, that for so many of us who want to succeed, for all of you who are going to go on to hopefully college or some other form of higher education, overwhelming effort is what it takes to get through tough times. I want to tell you a story now 
about overwhelming effort. My brother, Jeff, and I, he was my big brother. We're in business together. We were entrepreneurs. We started a real estate business, and we considered ourselves successful entrepreneurs. Together, we were learning the business. We managed a couple of thousand apartments here in the city of Chicago, and about a half million square feet of industrial and retail space. We had faced a lot of challenges, but we were thinking big. We believed that we had already built a great business and that we would continue to do so. There was a time when we wanted to buy a big building in downtown Chicago. And the building was in bankruptcy and it was a complicated, messy process and we knew that it was going to be hard and we would basically have to wrestle this building to the ground to get it. But we were up for the challenge and we knew we had each other and we knew we could do it together. He was my big thinking mentor. We had faced a lot of adversity as kids together, and so we had this bond along with our sister, and this notion that our pasts didn't define us, that the hardships in our life didn't define us, and that if we thought big, we could succeed. When we were in high school, our father was in federal prison. From a lot of people that I talked to in the months and years after, what I learned and what I'm constantly reminded about, and I hope I can impart this wisdom on you today, is that we are not defined by the hardships in our past. Casey's not defined by the hardships in her past. Siki wasn't defined by the hardships in her past. And I wasn't defined by the fact that my father was a convicted felon. I could think big. Six years ago, my big brother Jeff, that's him with his two beautiful babies, two of his three beautiful babies, was killed in a plane crash. The 20 seconds from takeoff to crash changed the course of my life and my family's life forever. My brother was a big thinker. He was a joyful guy. He loved life. He traveled around the world literally a couple of times. And so I think a lot today about the kindness and the thoughtfulness of my brother and his other traits, big thinking, and he was a mentor. He was a mentor to me, and he was a mentor to so many around him. And I think about how important that is for all of us. My brother was married with three beautiful young children. He lived a joyful life. He lived a big life. He was a big thinker, and he was kind. Most of all, my brother was courageous. On the screen is one of my favorite quotes. Life shrinks or expands in, proportions to one, in proportion to one's courage. Unfortunately, through a lot of hardships, I've learned to be courageous. So many of us have faced losses. Even all of you at your young ages, so many of you have had to face these things. And there's three pieces of wisdom I want to try to talk about today to help those of you who have faced loss and those of you who unfortunately someday will, which is all of us, unfortunately. First, get through the pain. There's no easy way, there's no recipe, there's no formula. Lots of good people are gonna tell you what you should do. There are no shoulds. You just have to get through the pain. Second, move forward. Almost immediately, I knew that I had to keep moving forward, and I did. And third, take from the people who helped you in those moments and help other people. The thing that has been the most fulfilling for me and probably the best tool I've had in moving forward with my life has been helping other people. And much of that comes in the form of mentoring and coaching. So, how do you design your life? How do you think big? How do you, in the face of adversity, in the face of tough times, in the face of the, uh, 
of the hardships we've had in our past. How do you design your life? Well, for me, I build stuff. I'm an entrepreneur. This is a, a picture of a building in the stockyards area in the city of Chicago. So for those of you who don't know who, where the stockyards are, this is the historic meatpacking area. And the stockyards are really next door to the back of the yards neighborhood, so near southwest side. When I built this building in 2011 for a company called Testa Produce, this was at the time the most energy efficient building that had ever been built in the United States. It was the first building in the city of Chicago to be powered by a wind turbine. By the way, that wind turbine is 240 feet tall. And if you are at Guaranteed Rate Field, I'm getting used to saying the new name of where the White Sox play, and you look up, you'll see our wind turbine. This is another building that we just finished building. This is a 188,000 square foot pizza warehouse in Romeoville, Illinois. So that warehouse stores about 5 million pounds of pizza every day. And if 5 million pounds of pizza sounds really great to you, it is really cool. And by the way, it's really cool. It's minus 10 degrees in there. So this is what it looks in. <laughs> looks like inside of that building. Um, this is, the pizzas are put it, packed into cases and put into this racking and then you can kind of see in the background there, there's a forklift that comes up and down and pulls those pallets out to ship the pizza. So we've talked a little about hardships and not being defined by things and, and, and for me, so much of being an entrepreneur has been, about, has been about overcoming my fears. So I say to you today, what would you do if you had no fear? This is a picture of the very first building that I built. And the story behind it is that one of my friends came to me and he said he owned a pizza manufacturing business. So if you can think about the pizzas that you see in the deli section of your grocery store, the pizzas that, or the pizzas you see at a convenience store that come in a brown box, take them home, cook them for 12 to 15 minutes, this is what they make. They make a million pounds of these per day. And he came to me and said, my business is growing, I need a new building. Can you build it for me? And I looked at him and I said, you know, Greg, you and I both know I've never done that before. He said, I know. He said, but you're a lifelong learner. You'll figure it out. Boy, was I afraid. We shook hands and I agreed to build him this building. And my brother and I went out and bought some land in Romeoville, Illinois. Romeoville, Illinois and we started the planning process for building, building and we started moving dirt on what had been a farmland. And I put all of my savings and everything I had into this project. And I went out and got some people to invest in this project and I lined up a lender to lend money to me to build this building and we were off and running. And then 2009 came along, known as the Great Recession. And in one day, all of my backers and my banker walked away from the project. In one day, everything I had spent 15 years building was going to be gone. I'll tell you that, that that day I shed a lot of tears, but I dug deep and I realized that I needed to go back to my big thinking and that I needed to be fearless and then I needed to be courageous. And so I called everyone I knew, and I told them the story of this building. And thankfully, we were able to raise the money and convince people to believe in what we were doing and to remind them that I had been a successful entrepreneur and that these setbacks weren't going to define me, that my successes would define me, that while the failures were inevitable, they weren't going to define my future. So we built the building, 
And today, that building still manufactures just over a million pounds of pizza per day. It's hard to understand what that means, but that's about 400 pizzas a minute. What I learned from that was not to be afraid. And I'm no longer afraid. Despite the setbacks I've had, I'm not afraid. One of the reasons I've not, I'm not afraid is that I have been fortunate, even though I came to it much, much later in life, to understand the power of mentors and coaches. So one or two of you, Kira, uh, may recognize someone in this picture. These are some of my mentors, coaches, advisors. Um, I've learned to surround myself with these people. I have learned that these people want to help me. I've learned that these people care about me. And I've learned the importance of surrounding myself. This is one of my favorite mentors and advisors. And a couple of days after my husband died, I was taking a nap. And I had said to my family, they were in my apartment, I said, I'm just going to sleep for an hour. And I went into my bedroom, and I think I passed out for about three hours. And when I woke up, sitting in a chair in my bedroom was this woman, Arna. And in my sort of haze of waking up, I looked at Arna and I said, how did you get here? As though I had sort of conjured her up. And she looked at me and she said, on an airplane. <laughs> And then she started talking to me, listening to my story. And she looked at me and she said, I want to know what you are going to do to move on with your life. I want to know what you're going to do to start immediately moving forward. Hard words to hear in the days after you've just lost to someone. But because she was my mentor, because I knew she cared deeply about me, I heard her words, and I started to listen to them. And I knew that I would have to be courageous. And I didn't know how, but I knew that I would be able to move forward from there. So here's my offer to all of you. I didn't come to understand the power of mentors, coaches, and advisors until late in life. Today, I understand it. Today, at any given time, I mentor four or five young people, different ages. And I'm ready to take on a few more. So we're going to make an offer to you, and we're going to work with your amazing teachers and principals and administrative staff here. By the way, they are a great source of helping you find mentors and coaches, ask for help. But we're going to work with all of them at your different schools, here at Whitney Young and the other high schools that are here, to offer a few opportunities um, to mentor some of you. So I hope that you will take us up on that. And what I want to leave you with today is the thought that predominates my thinking today. And that is that big thinking precedes great achievement. Thank you. Thanks for time. Thank you for listening.